going to talk a little bit about that now, and then we're going to talk about adult facial growth. So we got those two topics today. The exams are still not graded, but they're getting closer. I'm hoping by Friday to get them back to In general, people did well, so I don't think there should be a problem, but like I said, that was a mistake of like having you use the same exam book, so you have to wait for one person to grade them. All right, so uh, that one should work, work there, and then maybe this. Okay. So, compensation, and how does this sort of work? All right, let me write the screen. Okay. So, I brought my own colored chalk today. So, everyone knows. All right. If I draw something like that, and then I draw this buffer groove, let's just say this is a groove. Okay. Let's say this is 230 and this is 23, right? So we got 3 and 30. I think I got that right. First molars? Okay. So, the mesial buccal cusp here mm -hmm. and the buccal groove is present, that sort of fit of the teeth is present in about half of all human populations, which is pretty amazing, right? right? But what's even more amazing than that is that the range of variation from here, right, which is at the embrasure here, right here, and here, color here, we use green, I use green, I guess pink, right, and here, here, that this total distance is only six millimeters. So if we think about that, so the, the programming of the way mastication works is pretty tightly controlled. So it must be pretty important to be able to get your molars to come together. And I think that Dr. Latimer probably talked a little bit about how, you know, there's two different kinds of teeth. You've got the teeth that are continuously being replaced, right? And then you've got teeth like we have, which are discontinuous, right? If you lose a tooth, you're out, right? Those are the two basic evolutionary patterns. Like sharks just have lots of teeth, and if they lose one another, it just grows in to its place. And snakes are the same way, right? So, but what, what gives the evolutionary advantage to the molars is that you get different shapes of teeth. So in the discontinuous model in evolution, we have discontinuous shapes. So now we have the molars, right? And so molars are, are differentiated as opposed to like all the teeth looking alike. So we get this differentiation. So the molar occlusion is pretty tightly controlled. It's probably among the most tightly controlled developmental processes that we have. The reason that it can be so tightly in this, you know, all this huge variation in this whole room can be reduced to that small variation is because of all of the areas, all of the areas that, oh look, I'm, I'm the only one who uses the board. I, so it's here from yesterday. So um, I can see they don't wash the board in between night and night. Okay. So I would be good at this because my job when I was in college was to wash the boards at night and they paid. I'm good at it. All right. And I felt really bad because, you know, a lot of times I wouldn't, being a dentist, you know, it's like it was a little bit impulsive, so I wanted to make sure I always got the corners and everything was really, really clean. So one day I saw my boss and I said, how am I doing on that, on that thing? He says, you were doing the best job. The guy that had the job before you never did it. And we still paid him. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, so anyway, then I didn't feel bad. I left a few corners dirty. All right, so remember, we, when we talked about the brain, right? We talked about the brain. And then we talked about the interface between the brain and the face, right? The interface here, what's that called? Come on, I know it's late in the day. You already had pediatric dentistry, what was it you guys? Okay. You're out in the hall. What is it? Cranial base, yes. Cranial base, and the, the cool thing about the cranial base is that if you understand that the face is built on that cranial base, right? The face starts there. Face starts at the cranial base. So, you can have compensations starting right here at the angle, right? You can have a more acute or a more obtuse angle. So right at the base, you're gonna get these variations, right? You can get variations here in the length of the anterior cranial base. You can get variations in the length of the posterior cranial base. All right. One of the questions on the midterm was, you know, when does this sphenethmoidal synchondrosis fuse and when is the sphenoccipital synchondrosis fuse? And I think everybody got that pretty much right on if you took that one. Looked like the easiest question was the five parts of the mandible and their function. How many people did that one? Yeah, it was almost everybody's. Now I thought almost everybody got 100%. So that was good. So we got one. You got one. That was good. And that's what we wanted, was people to ask questions where you do the answers. That was the point. You know? The point was to ask things that we thought you knew. All right, so, so you got these two areas of compensation. So remember, what we're trying to build is, is how many different areas are there? How many different ways can we like change the face as the face is growing, keeping those first molars within six millimeters, okay? Half the time, bang on, and the other half of the time, either three millimeters in front or three millimeters back. It's not exactly, right? It's a continuum. So it's not like here or there. It's like here, 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 here or there. Right? There's lots of little variations. But it's all within a very, very small part. So if you, if one of the things that I, I might ask on the final is if we're going to do the essay thing. By the way, what did we decide? In-class essay, take home. Did we get any feedback on that? I never got heard back. No, it's it's really really <laughs> okay, that sounds good. Let's get the midterms back. I, I'm okay with that. All right, so um, but one question on, on the final, if we ask it, could be like, you know, it's amazing that, that, that teeth come together within six millimeters. You know, tell me what you know about compensation and facial growth, and then you can go from there. Right, so it's sort of the lecture I'm giving today. But with your own understanding of things, I won't be able to cover all the possible things. So if we look at this as the posterior cranial base and this is the anterior cranial base, all right, what part is associated with the anterior cranial base? What part of the face? The maxilla and nasal maxillary complex, right? So you got the nasal maxillary complex associated with the anterior cranial base. And so for those of you playing along at home, we know that the posterior cranial base must be the mandible, right? So, the mandible then has teeth, and so does the maxilla. So you basically have the anterior posterior cranial base, you've got the maxilla, you've got the mandible, you've got the maxillary dentition, you've got the mandibular dentition, You've got the articulation here, which everybody got right, the condyles primarily for articulation. Everyone got that one. That was good. There was some growth there, but everybody got that. You've got the ramus here, right, which we know has, is a big, is a big sets area for adaptation. Okay. So now, given that even just looking at the mid-sagittal plane, and we know that the goal is to establish what we talked about last time, which was the occlusal plane, right? The occlusal plane. So we know that teeth erupt until they hit the occlusal plane, and then what happens after they hit the occlusal plane and when the face continues to grow? What do we call that? Somebody said it. Drift. It's okay. If you're wrong, we're not going to grade down. Drift, okay? So eruption to the occlusal plane and then drift occurs after that, all right? So the idea 
that some people, when they said, what do they know for sure, some people didn't, weren't uh, totally clear on that idea that, that it, it erupts to the occlusal plane and then after that we call it drift. And there's two directions of drift that we talked about. One was towards the occlusal plane, which is vertical drift, right? And then we talked about the second kind of drift, which is mesial drift. Okay, so there's mesial drift and vertical drift. They're both separate from eruption. So now, think about all the ways, and this would be a good exercise for you if you want to do some preparation for the final exam, because I think that this is going to be one of the questions, whether it's a take home or it's not, is that, you know, I think people may got together in groups and looked at the learning objectives and outlined the answers, and I think it really helped, because a lot of people, you know, nailed it, unless your group had the wrong answer, then you all had the, the wrong one. But here, you sort of put together what you think is what all these things talk about it amongst yourselves, because this is the thing, and there's probably infinite possibilities, right? I'll just go over a couple. If the mandible, the body of the mandible, if the body of the mandible was short, okay, and everything else was normal, but the body of the mandible was short, So now we're talking about one anatomic part is short, the body of the mandible. Where could we get compensations and what kind of compensations would we need to have? What kind of compensation would we need to have, for example, in the teeth in order to get the molars to fit together? Because, right, if there was no compensation, right, that molar would be somewhere like here, right? Let's just say it'd be here. All right? And the upper molars here. So what sort of compensation would I need in my mandibular dentition to make up for a short mandibular corpus? Mesial drift, sort of mesial positioning anyway, right? You know, teeth can be angled sort of straight up or out like this, right? So with on the bone, the alveolus could be positioned more forward, right? All right? And if, the, if it was positioned more forward, then we might still have a class one molar. Does everybody get that idea? All right? Because it's a, it's an important concept that we can get these compensations anywhere. It doesn't have to just be in one spot. But in general, if the mandible, like here, what's another option that uh, say we didn't have that option? Okay, that's one option with the T. Go ahead. So you're, you're kind of speaking like the al alveolus is separate from the mandible, but... It's it is the alveolus, if you diagram the, the um, thing, the alveolus is separate from the mandible. The alveolus is a separate functional unit of the mandible. The alveolus holds the teeth, and the teeth can be positioned on that corpus in multiple yeah. ways. But like, I'm, I'm just trying to... Pay, that kind of looks like you're making two separate bones, but they really are... Like it's they're not two part. separate bones, they're two functional units. Just like the ramus is in a separate bone from the corpus. Yeah. But if you look at it, let me get a mandible out here, just so we can see if we have any bones here. Oh yeah, we got lots of bones here. It just juts out more, is what you're saying? Okay. So, so it's not a separate bone, but think about it, when there are no teeth, that bone's way different than this bone, right, with the teeth. Because that functional component is missing. I'll just let you start this one around. So the functional component. Now where those teeth are on that bone varies by individual. Because some people's teeth are tipped way out like that, some people's teeth are tipped back. So the alveolus can be shifted functionally, but it's not a separate bone. It just kind of looks like that. It's sort of like it's sort of way. forward, and then when you get to the end, you run out of bone, so the teeth start to lean out like that, right? Because they're sort of stuck into the bone this way. So you sort of run out of bone, right? You you can't stick the, you can't stick the teeth. They have to somehow still be stuck into the alveolus some, somehow. So what happens is that they might start here if this is normal, and as they come forward, they do this, right? And as that happens, the molar can move up. The incisors generally tip for it because they still have to be somehow connected there. Does that make sense to you guys? 
It's a good point. I mean, and I'm sure other people have the same question, so I want to make sure that we get that. It's a functional component, and that, that can be positioned on the corpus in multiple ways. Yes? I thought that most of the, uh, the compensatory remodeling occurred in the corpus. Okay, so that, so, so that would be incorrect. Because we're not talking about, we're talking about anatomic compensation to get to get teeth to fit at the occlusal plane. Okay. Now, if, if you looked at the, what's the, the purpose of the ramus, or we talked about what the functional nature of the ramus was, it was, it was an adaptation and remodeling. So you, you could be correct there. Let's take this another way. Let's say, okay, now we don't have the dentition. The dentition doesn't compensate. What's another way that we could get this mandible forward? And this is what the gentleman just brought up now. Make the ramus longer? Yes, exactly. We could, bring, we could bring this part and this part forward by just making a wider ramus or a different angle, but we could do it either way. In other words, that would carry the entire bone forward, right? But we would have a wider ramus than usual, all right? So you could have just a wider ramus and that would, that would take care of it, yes? So if that's not like the normal um, growth that's predetermined, what it's obviously happening because of bone resorption and deposition. So what's causing that resorption and deposition in a specific way to have these two different cuts? I'm not sure I understand the exact the, the exact question. Uh, but what's driving the teeth to fit together within the six millimeter probably has to do with the, the function of the of the of the masticatory system. In other words, it's probably more efficient. And there's got to be some signaling system. Uh, between the maxilla and the mandible, that as the mandible grows, it brings the maxillary teeth together with it. So they tend to tend to develop together, not in isolation. So as far as what what causes or what's the underlying cause of say a, a wider ramus, for example, okay, a wider ramus can have can be genetic. It can be a genetic compensation if an individual if, if a group has tendency for small corpuses, they might have a tendency for larger ramuses, so they can end up mandible ends up being the same. So it could be actually have a genetic basis. Does that help? Yeah. I mean, it gets complicated, and that's why you need to do some thinking about it. What's another thing you could do here, besides making the ramus wider, we also have this angle, right, between the condyle and the ramus, right? We call it a condylar angle. We could make it more obtuse, right? So if the angle from where the ramus joins the corpus is more obtuse, it's going to project that mandible further forward. If it's more acute, it's going to bring that mandible further back. I'm going to pass out a few more mandibles here just for fun. Okay. This might be that mandible we were looking for. Okay. So, so you got a couple mandibles here. You can see here the synthesis is back here. The teeth are out a little bit further, right? You could, if you looked at a bunch of different pictures of mandibles on the, on the internet, you'd see that some have the teeth tipping back, some teeth have the teeth tipping forward. Just pass this around so people get an idea of that. Here's another one. Look at the ramus. Look at, look at these two and look at the difference in the thickness of the ramus just on those two, and they're both adult mandibles. So there's all these variations, and all these variations they compensate for one another, right? So if you get a piece that's a little too big, another piece that's a little bit smaller, now it makes it the right size so it fits together with the molars. Does that make sense? Another way to think about it, you'll see this illustration in the book. If you had a tripod and it had three legs, but they were expandable, you could get this tripod to be level and I'm doing my best to make them the same length. That might not be perfect. If this is the A section, this is the A section, this is the B section, and this is the C section, the overall length here, this length here, we'll just call it Y, Or I got X, Y, and Z or something. Now here, the length of the legs, X equals Y equals Z. 
So you see how it works with the tripod, it's a little easier to decide. Now, but when we start to make these bones and teeth and things, now the, the actual combinations become almost infinite, right? Because you get a little compensation here, a little bit less there, a little more here, a little less there. The idea of understanding that that's what's happening is what I'm trying to get across to you. It's a lifetime to study that because that's actually most of what orthodontists do as far as diagnosis and treatment planning in orthodontics is almost all about figuring out in this phase where the compensations are, where they're not, which ones are aesthetically pleasing, which ones are not, which ones can I control because that, that's sort of the whole diagnosis and treatment planning in orthodontics is set up around this. What I'm trying to get across to you today is just this idea that these different parts can sum together to make a balanced face. Has everybody sort of got that? It'd be a good thing to go home and you get your study groups and just talk a little bit about it, get some actual cases or you know look at look at things online and things like that. And just say, oh I see this, look at this, look at that. Okay. So I wanted to make sure we touched on that, we touched on that there. Right. Now, the subject for today. So the, the, the first question is, and this is a question that people have been asking for a long time, and that is, when does facial growth stop? So when does growth, growth stop? Not when does it slow down, when does it stop? Okay, when does facial growth stop? 25 is a good idea. The reason why the gentleman says 25 is at age 25, generally your skeleton has its maximum mass. So the skeleton reaches maximum mass around age 25. So you reach maximum mass at age 25. But the truth is, is that everyone first thought growth just stopped. You know, there wasn't any more growth. You know how like old people look old and you could tell they're all crinkly and everything. And they, and they look all droopy and you don't have a problem with like telling your, you know, old uncle from your young, you know, your cousin and things like that. Yes. Specifically, you're thinking of like your condyle, isn't that? Reshaping throughout your life. See, the gentleman's been reading ahead. All right, exactly. Because the answer is, although we get our skeletal mass at age 25, and I and I and I do believe that that if we were looking at an accelerator curve, we would definitely see that 14-year-olds are changing way more faster than 18-year-olds, and 18-year-olds are changing faster than 20-year-olds, and 20-year-olds are changing faster than 30-year-olds. All right. And somewhere around 25 is what people say is that quote unquote, you know, like, like maximum density of bone, you've sort of reached your quote skeletal maturity. You've got to pick a number, all right? Some people might be a little less, some people might be a little more. But the truth and the answer to that question is you don't stop. The face does not stop growing until you die. And when you're dead, pretty much it's static, <laughs> all right? So, so the ultimate stability but is death. Is just because of the condyle? It's just because, no, it's not just because of the condyle. But you're, everything changes. It's a dynamic process. It's just the rate of change ch slows. So the rate of change goes slower and slower and slower and slower. So I'm changing way slower than you are. All right? And people used to think it was just the effect of gravity that my skin looked saggy and that kind of thing. And you got all wrinkly from smiling too much and all those sorts of things. But actually, we did the work here at Case to prove that the human face grows up until the 70s and 80s. Okay, the work was done right here. You should probably know a little bit about it. It was done here in the Bolton Brush Growth Study Center, which is still located on the third floor of the, of the dental school. It's where the imaging center is now. Well, what they did in 19, starting in 1930, so what, about 80 years ago now? At least, right, 85 years ago? In Cleveland, they had these contests for healthy kids. And if your kid was healthy enough and won the contest, they got put into what was called the Bolton Study, which studied growth and development of normal kids. 
So every year around your kid's birthday, you brought him here to the dental school. At the time, it was in the basement, okay, of the old building. And they went through a bunch of tests, you know, strength tests and lung volume tests. They took x-rays of every joint in the body and the head and the front, all the, all the joints, all the hands, every year on your birthday. And they charted all this for normal growth and development. So between birth and 18 years of age, they had about 2,000 kids that came in every year on their birthday. So it's the largest study in the world of longitudinal growth of the human skeleton and especially the face. If you go to your pediatrician and they take a hand wrist x-ray, they'll use a Grulican Pile Atlas. That Grulican Pile Atlas of the hand and wrist was developed here at Case Western Reserve School of Dental Medicine. It's used all over the world by pediatricians to determine skeletal age. But your career in dentistry, especially it's embedded here, okay? Remember we talked about, this is number eight, this is number nine, right? We talked about what's going to happen with these teeth over time, okay? What's the general direction of drift of teeth? Mesial and vertical, right? Mesial and vertical. So we know that over time, these teeth are going to drift down a little bit, right? How much are they going to drift down? Well, between ages 8 and 12 or something, it's a lot. It's like 6, 8 millimeters. It's a ton, right? Because you got this little baby. Well, what about now between 25 and 35 or 35 and 55? It's going to be a small amount. It's going to be on the order of 1 to 2 millimeters, okay, over 20 years. So it's not really that noticeable. It's like trying to watch grass grow, and then you're not going to see it. Now, when might this show up in your dental office? What could you do with a patient that would, would really demonstrate this to them really well? You could put an implant in for their upper central incisor at age 25, and then 25 years later they come back and there's two or three millimeters difference, right? Now, does that mean you shouldn't do it? No, but I think you need to inform people that that's a possibility, that we do see small amounts of change on the order of a millimeter to two millimeters over a lifetime. Right? Now, what sort of saves us in terms of adults and implants like that? Does everybody get what I just said there? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I think that's pretty much... But what saves us in terms of the patient is that if we get a millimeter less on our, let's make this one our implant, right? Now we're 20 years later. And we've got this, right? Just say. All right, now you got that. Now, we already talked about that the implant is really hard to take out, right? But somebody asked the question of, can't you just redo the top part, right? And the answer to that is yes, you can just redo the crown. You can just redo the crown. And if it's only a millimeter, I'm looking for my other color. Okay, here it So I, we can just do a crown here, right? Just put a new crown on. Alright? And as long as you're just looking at the edges, it's going to look fine, right? When is it going to be a problem? The gingiva? If you show your gingiva, right? If you show the gingiva. Because now you've got a big headlight here, right? Because that one's bigger than the other. And actually, that's a really, really common aesthetic problem that goes un uh, undiagnosed even in natural teeth. You get one really short one and then one really tall one, and if you see the gingiva, everybody goes, ooh, that looks terrible. Sometimes they don't even know why it looks terrible. Now, what saves us, and this is another finding of, of Barrett's, what saves us in the adult is that as the teeth are going down one to two millimeters, 
the smile line and the upper lip is going down more. So if this goes down a millimeter, this goes down about 1.5. So the lip is growing longer and at a faster rate than the teeth are erupting. So even if that tooth gets high, we can replace the crown on it and it'll save us because older people don't show as much teeth. Right? The older you get. Now when you make dentures, that's one of the things you'll learn is like how much tooth should an older person depends on how young they want to look, right? The more gum you show, the younger you look. The less you don't show any teeth. If you don't show any gum, it makes you look old. Why is that? Well, because we know, because we're humans, that younger people, their lips are not as long. They show more gum when they smile, right? Whereas in the adult, the lips are coming down, so you're showing less and less of the teeth as you do it. So the soft tissue grows vertically, and the hard tissue grows, grows vertically, the teeth especially, with the drift. So those two things, that's important to know, it's one of the learning objectives. Okay? Now, there's another thing that Barrett's found that was really sort of interesting, and you probably, you might, um, you might be able to, to, to guess this. So how many, how many women here have had kids? I guess I'm not allowed to ask that. If I'm not allowed to ask it, don't answer. Does anybody have kids? All right. It's pretty well known that, you know, women will report when they're pregnant that they change shoe size. And what Barrett's found was that when women were pregnant, they actually grew. The mandibles grew because of the change in the hormones, the extra growth hormone, that pituitary uh, gland. The changes that occur during pregnancy actually cause growth of the mandible in women. So he saw actually a little growth spurt during pregnancy. So women during pregnancy have the, we'll see increased growth. So it's not just that you know, shoe size changes. It's not just you know because it's soft tissue. But this is really hard tissue change. It could be the mandible growing. Very common, and you might see this in your practice. You'll see a woman who has perfect teeth, has two or three kids, comes in and has a space between their upper incisors. <laughs> right, space between the upper incisors. Perfect teeth. Perfect teeth. They're in your office. You know, you see them. You know, it was perfect. They come back in, they've had a couple kids, it's like five, six, eight years later, now they've got a space. What's the reason behind that? You should think back to facial growth, to what we said today, because if the mandible grows, right, when the mandible grows, right, the mandible grows, if you have normal overbite of the teeth, you could then see these teeth flare out, and if the teeth flare out, if they're not big, they're going to get a space, right? because they're going to go forward and there's not enough room so they get a space. So you'll see this sometimes. The other thing that you see is during pregnancy, because of this growth, what bounds, what's, what binds your, the, the mandible at the posterior edge, the TMJ, depending on how much space there is between someone's centric occlusion and how far back you know they can bite, and there's how, how much the mandible can, how much play is there in that mandible. Now you can te you can test yourself here if you want. You can open, you tip your head down, close, and if your front teeth tip your head down like this, and if your front teeth hit before your back teeth when you do that, you don't you're really close to to being having that not much room in the posterior of the condyle. So if you do this, you're right there. Right there. This comes into play a lot of times now. How many people hit their anterior teeth? I do. Right? If you hit your anterior teeth, then you, you're really right there. All right? If you have a vertical overbite like that, you tip your head down and you hit your front teeth first, you don't have a clear path of closure. It's not fatal. I've had it since I've been your age, too. Okay, it's not a fatal condition. But what it means is, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, 
But what it means is that occasionally, if you get any swelling in the joint at all, your posterior teeth won't fit together. They'll wake up in the morning and you won't be able to get your teeth together because you've got extrusion of fluid in the joints and it holds the back teeth apart. Just let, during the day, you squeeze that fluid out and your teeth come back together. People that don't have that problem don't notice that that ever happens. So those of you with that not unclear path of closure will notice that your joint's really tight. Now, again, why do I say this? Because women that, have a, that don't have a clear path of closure are at really increased risk for temporomandibular joint damage during pregnancy because what else happens besides growth, which is a problem, okay, is those hormones start loosening up all the joints, right? And one of the joints they start loosening up is the temporomandibular joint. So you couple that with this other problem, and that's why you see increase in, in you know, TMJ problems. So adult facial growth, women have special risk because of the pregnancy factor. In general, if we were going to, all right, in general now, if we were going to talk about we're almost out of time, so I gotta get this last point in there. In general, if we looked at just sort of the overall pattern. Now women have these special things you gotta think about in the long-term growth and development. If we look at the overall pattern, between males and females. This is taking any hormonal changes out of it. In general, women are going to grow more vertically. And men we'll see an increase in horizontal, okay? So we looked at the groups, and you'll see it in the book, there's a good illustration of this, um, that, that you'll see that in general, the pattern for men is a little bit more mandibular growth anteriorly, and a little bit more forward development, and women, it's a little bit more vertical, okay? So vertical, so women's faces are getting a little longer and men's faces are getting a little more protrusive over this long span that occurs between age 25 and 85. Now, where exactly in that this growth occurs, they did not get x-rays every 10 years because when Barron brought everybody back, he just brought them back whatever age they were. So the range was, you know, inconsistent. In Some people had the last x-ray at 25, maybe they came in at 55. So he had to average out all the changes. But what he showed definitively was that in fact, it's not just the soft tissues that are changing, but the hard tissues. So the chapter's worth a, worth a, a read uh, to just make sure you understand these things. There's some nice diagrams in there that just are better than my drawings here on the, on the board. But that's what you want to get out of this, the adult facial growth. I touched on the compensation thing earlier too today. All right, any questions? We've got a few minutes left. So we started a couple minutes late. Go ahead. Um, you know when you said that, that it like goes down, like the teeth move like one to two millimeters? Yeah. What is like the average attrition that you get? Like, tr oh, tooth wear. Yeah. Yeah, tooth wear is really interesting. I mean, most people have almost no wear on their teeth. Uh -huh. So most modern humans have to show almost no wear. There are a subset of people that brux at night, mm -hmm. but can wear up, you know, if you've got an overbite, they'll just wear it till it's flat, right? And, and of course, that. if we look at Aboriginal peoples and things like that, mm -hmm. now you're seeing a coarser diet, and you're seeing there, they're seeing, they're, they're, they can have the enamel totally worn off and they're into the den. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, you know, we see, but mo most modern populations have very little actually enamel wear because our diets are so processed right now. Any other questions? End of the day, late, tired. You know how um, one of the compensatory, compensatory yes. mechanisms um, was how the broad eye angle could be more acute? Yes, could be more acute too. 
Right. But then if the um, the ramus is more obtuse, wouldn't the way that the drops um, have to be modified so, so it, 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 you you put in a great this you know this is the whole point. When you change one thing there's a chain reaction. Right. So you're right. So a lot of times, I'll just sit, tell you the answer because I've studied it for a long time. A lot of times when you have an obtuse conial angle, okay, the teeth are actually erupting a little bit more vertically. Because if they did up, up that way, you'd have an anterior crossbite. So they're actually leaning back a little bit. But you're exactly right. That, that the alveolus, and this is where the gentleman that asked about is it a separate bone. It's not, but it's a separate functional piece, that those teeth can, can drift more mesial or more distal as the face grows depending upon the compensatory mechanism that's been activated. So it's not a separate bone, clearly. But each tooth is a separate unit within that. Okay. All right, in the people that sent me last time things that they thought that they knew, okay, a couple of people weren't clear on the eruption versus drift, so make sure you read that section in the book if you, you know, that eruption stops where the tooth hits the occlusal plane, and anything that happens after that is death, is drift, okay, and drifts continues, and then if you have loss of a tooth, you can get what would be called super eruption, because eruption is the process of a tooth coming into contact with something that stops it for a moment. But the drift process is what occurs when the bones are displaced, okay? So just, does everybody get that? There's like two concepts there. There's eruption and drift. Drift has to do with the teeth are in occlusion, right? But the face is going downward and forward. And to keep the teeth together, so the occlusal, you maintain contact with the occlusal plane. Teeth drift towards the occlusal plane. The other concept is the eruption, which occurs initially when the tooth is not even in the mouth, right? It comes in, it breaks through the outer breaks through the gingiva and it erupts till it, it, till it reaches some sort of opposing force. All right? So, so if, in fact, it can erupt. Sometimes that opposing force is in another tooth. It can be the roof of the, you know, the roof of the mouth and the anterior. It could be the posterior um, sinus. Could be anything. It could just keep erupting. That's, but that's erupting. Erupting is until something stops it. The part of the drift is when the bones change and then the teeth have to be able to adjust their position within them on that drift. And then we have mesial and vertical. And everybody seemed to have that. Okay? So let's call it a day, I think, huh? Thanks. I don't know what our next talk is. Which one? No, last time. No, if you don't send me something, that's real.